This presentation is based on the idea that I didn't become president of the Principals Association five years ago thinking we want collective bargaining rights. Well, I became president thinking I want to serve my members. I'm going to see what the challenges are. But over those first three years, challenge after challenge being ignored, bad policy after bad policy decision, collective bargaining rights surfaced amongst our membership as a solution. And so instead of talking about bargaining rights, I want to take you through six of the multitude of issues that occurred over these those first three years and over the last five in general that led us to this point, to this decision where it looks like collective bargaining rights is the lifeline that our principals need. And it's a good metaphor because many have told me they are drowning right now. So the context of collective bargaining, I want to go over six issues. And again, there are dozens of them, but just six for today. Lack of principal voice and how it led to substandard reopening plans. The CPS eligibility process and how it violates principal and local school council rights. The special education violations that did great damage and harm to so many students and how that would not have happened if principals had a voice. District retaliation, harassment, and the loss of effective educators in the principal pipeline connected to compensation issues. First, the lack of principal voice in the substandard reopen plans. This represents what students went back to last spring when schools reopened. Remember, CPS said, we have to get these black and brown kids back. They need in-person learning. This remote learning isn't working for them. This graphic shows you the percentage of in-person classrooms with a remote teacher across the district. 17% of classrooms with majority white students came back to in-person learning with a remote teacher. 35% of Hispanic students came back to in-person learning with a remote teacher. And almost 50%, one out of every two black students came back to in-person learning only to be greeted with a remote teacher. The problem here is that we told CPS as a principal's association, as principals, that this was going to happen because we keep in constant contact. We survey our members about the conditions. We told them this. They ignored it. And so the very students they claimed that they were trying to help by reopening schools were the ones they hurt the most. And here's one on recess. 29% of white students came back and couldn't have recess for staffing issues. 35% of Hispanic students and more than half of black students came back to in-person learning with no ability to have recess. And the question is, is this something that the governor's office supports or, or more likely, more, more, more accurately, is, is the lack of collective bargaining and principal voice that led to this something that the governor's office wants to continue to see? And again, we went to the board repeatedly about this and they ignored us. This is a piece of feedback we got from one principal uh, from a respected magnet school. She said, and I quote, the plan CPS are making without our voice once again pit teachers against building and administrators and creates impossible situations in buildings. This recent plan, removing health screens and temperature, temperature checks leaves everyone unsafe. We have no answers for our teachers or parents uh, about the health and safety of our students or ourselves. Again, there cannot be just one plan for 652 individual schools. Principals are drowning. We're overwhelmed and undersupported. And the only response we're hearing is, we see you. Yes, they see us drowning, but won't even invite us to the table to find out how to help us. And this is not just one principal. This represents a supermajority. We did a survey of our principals and asked them a simple question about their faith in the leadership team in terms of whether or not they were satisfied in the job the CPS senior leadership team was doing during the COVID pandemic and reopening. And 72% of respondents said they were either not satisfied or actively dissatisfied. And so this sentiment is widespread. Now I wanna talk about the principal eligibility process. It does three things wrong. It denies due process, it shows racial bias, and it undermines state laws on local school councils. In order to help understand this CPS eligibility process, I want to compare it to the state process. Because basically, the, state, the eligibility process is like a local certification process, which is not supposed to happen, by the way, but it's happening. And so the CPS certification, let's compare it to the elements of the state certification. State certification, in order to be certified as an administrator, a school administrator, uh, that's, you have that state certification. So it certifies as a principal, it certifies you for a principal position or an assistant principal position in Illinois. There are clear and transparent score criteria. You have to score 240 on both parts of the test. Very transparent. You get your score. 
right? That may sound simple, but let me, when I get to the CPS process, you'll see where I'm saying this. You get, you know what you scored. You scored 239. You know you're not going to get a certification, and you know why. Your certification status is public. Any of you can look up myself or right now and find out our certification status. You can see a list of who's certified to be a principal in Illinois. There's substantive due process if you're denied by your preparation program, if you're denied uh, certification or recommendation for certification. And your certification can be revoked after two unsatisfactory ratings. Now let's look at the CPS process. One, it nullifies state certification. It basically says we don't care if you have a state certificate, except for the ones that the CEO picks. There's an exception if the CEO just happens to like you, by the way. The score and rubric is hidden and secret. You don't get your score, ever. You barely get feedback. You have to beg for it. And when you beg for it, you come into a meeting and they'll say, well, you need more work on competency A. And that's it. You don't know what the score criteria is. You don't get score. You don't get feedback. And then your eligibility status or the eligibility list is hidden, even from the local school councils who have to select the principals. And so if a principal wants a job, he has to apply to CPS. And then CPS then sends the candidates they want to the local school councils, and often even people who are on the list don't get forwarded to the local school council if they ticked off the wrong person in CPS. That is the most blatant violation of the state statute that gives local school councils the right to select their principals that I have seen. When we met with them, their lobbyist pulled up a web page, and I'm going to pull up the web page he pulled up to show you what he pulled up and what happened and transpired to, he, to address this idea of transparency. He pulled up this web page and said, what do you mean? We have the whole process on a website. And I said, it shows, and he started looking through the thing. And I said, you're not going to find what you're looking for. This website shows you how to apply. We've never said or complained about the application. It's the decision-making part. Yeah? And we have three very important and distinct aspects of decision-making. One, what is the criteria? Two, people don't get their score. Three, the list is not public. You're not going to find the criteria on that site You're not, or the rubric on that site, the score criteria. You, you certainly are not going to find the scores that you give to principals or that you assign to principals because you don't even give it to them. You damn sure don't put them on a site. And uh, three, that list is still hidden. None of that is on this site. So let's not try and pretend and confuse the issue that we're saying that the application process is not transparent. It's the decision making about someone, whether a person is eligible or not. That is the thing that lacks transparency. You won't see that anywhere. Not the site, not information given to applicants. You will find it nowhere. And that is a serious problem. So that's what they said. And even when I said that, he said, point taken. <laughs> that, was, that was his response. Point taken taken and he left it alone and there's no due process you don't get selected you don't get selected there is no recourse even if you make it through all of that they can revoke it after one rating of not unsatisfactory satisfactory if you already satisfactory one time your eligibility is revoked and right now only the network chief's rating is taken into account. So the way a principal is rated by one downtown bureaucrat overrides the rating of the entire local school council. Not surprising, this process has led to racially inequitable results. 36% of white candidates who've applied have been denied, while 50% or more of black and Hispanic candidates have been denied eligibility. Now, this is eerily similar to another story that happened a few years ago, because they had a similar process for teachers. And they found through a WBEZ FOIA request that the teacher process had equally inequitable results. 20% of white candidates denied, 42% of Hispanic candidates, and over 50, over half of black candidates, teacher candidates were denied. As soon as this story came out, Dennis Jackson, CEO of CPS, cut the program, just ended it. Obviously, when we saw the data, it was troubling. This is what she said which is why we sought to reverse that policy swiftly. Obviously, any type of practice where a minority is disproportionately impacted, we want to shut that down. Well, that's not true. They shut it down for teachers because teachers have collective bargaining rights. But this practice is still in existence today, despite this data for principals, despite its racial inequity. And I should say principals are majority black and brown women, while teachers are majority white. This is the data over time that shows the impact of this and other racially inequitable policies. These are principles 
black principles, these are white principles, and these are Hispanic principles. As you can see, Hispanic principles have declined uh, slightly, white principles have increased, and black principles have declined quite a bit. This is the same graphic for assistant principles. As you can see, the number of black assistant principles has declined by more than 100 since 2011. That's what's happening to our principles and assistant principles. And so what I did was this data right here is based on a survey. And I always like to balance my survey data with actual data from CPS. So I do a lot of FOIA requests. So I requested the actual racial breakdown of this eligibility data. And they actually responded to me that the board does not in the ordinary course of business maintain or generate reports showing the various data points you listed in your FOIA request. So you're telling me after this happened right, and you had to end this program, you create another program for principals and you decide you're not even going to track racial data to see if this program is equitable. Either they're lying or this is actually true. Both are unacceptable. But that's the life and the reality of a principal in CPS, what they get away with because we don't have collective bargaining rights. And I hope that the governor does not support this. Again, we went to the district, complained about it, still in existence. The big piece about this eligibility thing, though, it's not just as an attack principals, it's an attack on local school councils. As I said, the list of eligible candidates is hidden from the people who are supposed to have the right by the state to select principals in Chicago. Candidates can't apply to an LSC. They have to apply to CPS and CPS then forwards whoever it wants. They basically have taken over the role of selecting principals from the local school councils. It's also interesting to note that all witness slips submitted by local school councils to this bill are proponents, not opponents. And so CPS continues to claim somehow that our legislation might uh, somehow impact LSC rights but all of our, all the LSEs who have weighed in on this are supporting this bill because they understand the only people who are impacting LSE rights negatively is CPS itself. Our bill, HB 3496, would protect local school council rights by requiring the district to do the following. Establish and publish clear, specific, and objective criteria. Provide each candidate with a complete assessment of their candidacy. Create due process protections like those established for state licensure. And these last two are the most important for local school councils. Establish a public database that allows them to pick from the entire pool of eligible candidates instead of having them filtered through CPS. And finally, it establishes that eligibility can be revoked if the chief and the local school council rate that principle unsatisfactorily. And that gives the local school council more power to protect their leadership. Now, lack of principal voice and how it led to special education violations. You guys might remember the Illinois State Board of Education appointed a monitor to deal with CPS special education violations. But you may not know that that monitor came about as a result of parents and principals coming together to push ISB to investigate CPS. And principals had actually come together almost a year before that because we knew the changes that were coming down. We were talking about them. We were giving feedback that was being ignored that people didn't feel comfortable raising the alarm because they didn't want to be retaliated against. And so those changes went into effect and so many students were robbed of their educational services as a result of those changes. And CPS is now to this day paying families thousands of dollars a piece because of what they robbed their students of. And it all could have been stopped if principals had a voice in that process that we still don't have today. Here's one example of one of the things that went down. If you would, couldn't get a special ed position in your budget for a kid, you got to do an appeal. The 10 schools with the highest percentage of white students got more than $1 million in appeals money. The 10 schools with the lowest percentage of white students, all of which were majority black, received nothing. Not only did ISBE investigate CPS for breaking special education law, but the state legislature held hearings on the issue as well. Is your school district is not performing well, or uh, uh, some of the things are so extreme. This is one which I think is very extreme. Uh, we do have resources at our level to do something. That uh, we intend to, to rectify to the best of our ability. And I want to acknowledge that there are some um, decisions that were made that areas where we moved um, too far, too fast on some things and actually rolled them back. It was at that same hearing that Representative Kathleen Willis talked about retaliation against principals and asked the question that gave birth to the idea of us going to the state legislature to restore our collective bargaining rights. To me, that's a hostile environment 
that you're working in, that you are caught between a rock and a hard place. So to keep your job, you have to cut services to students that definitely need them. Um, has your union stepped up and said, we're going to try to protect you if you are a whistleblower and say this isn't right or, or not do it, or is this not gone to that extent yet? Well, for us, we would need some uh, help from the state legislator, legislature to make us an official union so that we can have union protections. We don't have that. Okay, uh, so as state, administrators, you don't have an administrative union? We have an administrative association that is union-like. We don't have collective bargaining rights as principles. We have collective begging rights as principles. But that could be changed with an act from the state legislature, so I'm glad you mentioned that. And now, district retaliation. It was at a Chicago Board of Education meeting that I talked about one of the clearest examples of a district retaliating against its principals, and I'll show you that here. In 2008, Mrs. H left Kellogg Elementary School after serving just two years of a four-year principal contract. In essence, she aborted her first principalship. Now, our greatest successes often come from failure, so let's look at her second principalship at Bethune. Bethune was a turnaround school, and turnarounds have to be judged in relationship to one another because achievement often starts so low that there's nowhere to go but up. The greatest three-year composite increase in students meeting standards from an individual school was 47%. The average increase was 25%, and the lowest increase was 14%. And that 14% was for Bethune School during the three years that Mrs. H. served as its principal. It is noteworthy that while she was principal at Bethune, Mrs. H joined Rahm Emanuel's election campaign committee and he thanked her by name in the speech he made the night he was elected. And I want to thank my campaign committee, which includes Zipporah Hightower. After three years, she left Bethune. It was her second time leaving a principalship before serving a full four years. Bethune was closed a year later. By the district's own standard for closing schools, her principalship was a failure. Maybe she finally pulled it together in her third principalship. Sadly, however, there was no third principalship. After just five years and two aborted principalships, Mrs. H never attempted to lead a school again. So her record as a principal was just five years of experience, two aborted principalships, low performance compared to similar schools, and actively campaigning for a mayoral candidate while her school struggled and was eventually closed. We have to ask, what is the ultimate goal when district officials look at that substandard record as a principal and conclude, this is the person we want to lead in office that determines whether an already state-certified school administrator can become a principal in CPS? Is that the decision of people looking to improve principal quality or looking to ensure loyalty to a political agenda? Well, we have some evidence to answer that question. After assuming control of the office, Mrs. H allegedly engaged in one of the two most despicable acts of targeting a principal for political purpose that I have ever heard, and I've heard quite a few. A few years ago, the most beloved principal in Chicago, the late Robert Croston, was working with Principal Michael Byer to merge Rob's majority black school, Jenner, with Michael's majority white school, Ogden. Rob knew the merger would cost him his job because you can't have two principals in one school. But he said this was not about stability for himself, it was about stability for his students. He believed that if he took care of them, the Lord would take care of him. The district opposed his vision for a merged integrated school and it's public knowledge that the district targeted and removed Michael Byer from his position at Ogden. But almost no one knows that they also targeted Rob Croston while he was sick, threatening to discipline him because he sat panel and answered a few questions while on medical leave as if that's somehow comparable to the relentless high stress demands of running a school. Rob contacted the principals association and in writing he made it very clear who targeted him. He wrote and I quote Zipporah Hightower saw me and she told Chip and then he texted me and said they'll bring some serious ethics violations unquote. When I asked him why he was being targeted he wrote, and I quote, they're trying to put something on me because this merger might go down and you know they want to castrate us, unquote. A few weeks after informing us that he'd been targeted by Mrs. H, Zipporah Hightower, Rob was back in the hospital and he never came out. It was only then that the district was shamed into supporting Rob's dream of an integrated school merger. 
And for the record, I exchanged several texts with Zipporah about the fact that I was going to make these issues public, but when I asked if she targeted Rob on her own or was directed to do so by the CEO or mayor's office, she stopped responding. This is just one high-profile example of what clearly looks like hiring and appointing CPS officials based on political patronage rather than professional excellence. Those patronage officials then go on to target and harass principals who are more loyal to their students and school communities than they are to those officials and to the mayor. In conclusion, you all know this is not just about one official. She just happens to be one of the clearest examples. You know what Jarvis Sanford put principals through, and there are at least five more network chiefs whose abusive behavior and harassment need to be exposed. You know that this eligibility policy gives people like that unchecked power over the professional lives of principals. Next, harassment and lack of disciplinary due process. I'm gonna use the case of Jarvis Sanford, but there are many like him. And as a principal for public persons, I call Michelle. She improved attainment and achievement. She increased student enrollment. She sent 10% of students in a high poverty majority black school to selective enrollment schools. But Jarvis Sanford, so this is how he treated her. He prevented her local school council from, cause she was a, what you call a, um, an interim principal. CPS, another way CPS violates LSC authority. They have these so-called interim principals. Interim is supposed to be a few months. You got principals who've been serving as interims in CPS for 10 years, right? It's a way, so if they stay interim, the LSC can't pick a principal and give them a contract, give CPS more power. And so he was trying to prevent the local school council from posting a position. He wouldn't post it. And as he's doing this, he's trying to force Michelle to resign. He's giving her threats, toxic verbal abuse, and there's the hospital incident where she was hospitalized, couldn't do her school budget. Her assistant principal wanted to do it for her. Jarvis wouldn't let her do it and sent one of his minions to the hospital bed and gave her the budget and a due date. This is what he did to her. The OIG sat on multiple complaints for more than a year. And finally, after we went to CPS, the law the OIG gave it to to the law department, excuse me, the, the law department. And the law department calls Michelle and says, okay, we're gonna interview you about Jarvis's conduct next week. But before that week passed, they served her with a hearing notice against her, supposedly from a complaint from a parent, but parent, but the main witness on this uh, in this hearing was guess who? Jarvis Sanford. So the office that was supposed to be investigating, interviewing Michelle to investigate Jarvis conspired with Jarvis to retaliate against Michelle for filing the complaint in the first place. There is no safe haven for principals and CPS, not even in the law department. And it wasn't until we went to the Board of Education and publicly called out this behavior that the OIG finally took over the case and Jarvis was removed after 15 years of doing this to people. Does the governor support this? Does the governor want to see the thing that led to it continue, which is the lack of bargaining rights for our principals? Right now, I want to talk about compensation and the fact that the compensation structure right now is depleting us of good school leadership. This is the salary of a 52-week teacher. Principals work 52 weeks a year, then they're 52-week teachers, so they're the best ones to compare. This is the salary scale of a 52-week teacher. The color codes, the dark orange is our teachers on that salary, points on that salary scale where they make more than a principal. The mid-level orange is where they make more than assistant principal. And, you know, teachers go from teacher to assistant principal, then to principal. And so if you're a teacher and you're on the salary scale, where is the incentive for you to become a principal? I had principals tell me that I've had, he, the, the quote was, I have a teacher who is exquisitely prepared for leadership, but she won't take it because she doesn't want to take a salary cut, right? And it's a salary cut because, again, teachers have bargaining rights. They keep getting raises and principals, you know, we don't. Uh, and so as a result, this is where we are. And we are losing the best potential leaders from our teacher ranks because they don't want to take salary cuts for a promotion. That makes no sense. But the big takeaway is right here that principals and APs who are majority black and Hispanic are making less than the majority white teaching force that they supervise. Again, is that something the governor wants to put his name behind and say he he supports or supports the lack of collective bargaining that led to this? We hope that he does not. Then there's this idea that principles are management. That is false. The current Illinois law defines principles as supervisors. Here's a quote. A supervisor is any individual having authority to hire, transfer, suspend, lay off, recall, promote, discharge, reward, or discipline other employees. That's what a principal does. Principals are supervisors. 
Now, here's our three-step logic for manager. And this is in states where principals have collective bargaining rights, and they're about 20. So this is something, nothing new. Uh, just as teachers manage individual classrooms, principals manage individual schools. However, neither one of us manages the district. We implement district policy, but neither of us makes district policy. And so if you have no significant role in making district policy, you should have the right to bargain with the district officials who do make that policy. And this is not, it's not even new in Chicago outside of education, right? The district likes to pretend like, oh, this is going to crowd this problem. We don't know what we would do. They know it because they do it with the police department right now. Sergeants, lieutenants, and captains are all supervisors. And they manage subunits of police departments the way we manage subunits of the district. But they don't manage the department as a whole. They don't make department policy. And so each rank has its own separate bargain. In fact, captains manage a section of the city that encloses 25 schools on average. And yet those captains, with all of that responsibility, have bargaining rights. Surely a principal in one of those 25 schools could also have bargaining rights. He supervises much less territory in a much smaller unit of the district than the captain supervisors of the police department. Here are some examples. And they have different units based on their supervisory roles. There's a bargaining unit for sergeant with its own contract. Lieutenants have a contract. Captains have a contract. So this is nothing new. And so these, this is a summary of the issues. Those are the six issues that I just presented, but there are many more. I'm not gonna go over them all, but here's just a few, understaffing. Excessive and redundant co compliance mandates, central office people who force principals to do their jobs. The auditors have done it. Tra contact tracers have done it. Even if you remember the um, Office of Student Protections that was set up when the sexual abuse complaints came, one of the things they were set up for is because they didn't want principals investigating incidents in their own schools. Well, guess what they're making principals do now? They're making them do the investigations that OSP is supposed to be doing, which is why they were set up in the first place. Filthy schools, severe onboarding delays, facilities and repairs. And the one I have to spend at least 30 seconds talking about is the CPS versus local school council dilemma, where CPS can fire you and your local school council can also fire you by non-renewing your contract. And when CPS comes down with a mandate, that you have to implement that your local school council doesn't like. You're like no one else in the state has to deal with this. That's why this is a only a Chicago only boy. You have two bosses with opposing views who can both fire you. And so collective bargaining would enable principals to feel like they have the protection to stand with their local school councils more often and more assertively. But we don't have that protection right now. And the list goes on and on and on. Last two slides. Our labor support, we have the AFL-CIO, the Chicago Federation of Labor, the Illinois Federation of Teachers, the American Federation of School Administrators, CTU, all in support of this bill. And lastly, concessions. So there were five throughout the process. The first was to make it a Chicago-only bill as a result of concerns raised from downstate. We changed the local school council language in three places, making it absolutely clear that Local school council authority given by the state will not be touched or impacted at all uh, by this bill. I'm uh, making it clear that if any collective of bargain, if there's anything in any collective bargaining agreement, uh, there can't be anything in the collective bargaining agreement that impedes upon that authority. And if it is, uh, the authority wins. We are not trying to get bargaining rights vis-a-vis -vis LSCs. We're trying to get bargaining rights vis-a-vis -vis the district. The LSCs do not create issues for us. It's the district that creates the issues that make it difficult for us to do our jobs and serve our students. We also added a delayed effective date for 2023 to give the administration time to adjust. And by the administration, I mean the mayor's office and CPS. Most significantly, we put a no strike clause in. And probably the most significant thing about that is the ease with which it was done. We're not trying to create labor acrimony. Principals don't want to strike. Principals simply want a voice. And it's one thing to just say we just want a voice. But by putting that no strike clause in, we make it absolutely and undeniably clear that that's what we're looking for here, a voice, because it's what we don't have right now.